Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm delighted to welcome a veteran Hollywood actor who is instantly recognizable from the many roles he has played in movies and on TV since the mid-70s. He has co-starred with everyone from Robert Redford to Betty Davis to Wesley Snipes to Woody Harrelson and everyone in between. He is Ernest Hardin Jr. Ernest, thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you so much, Harvey, for inviting me. Ernest, there is so much to talk about because you've had a truly remarkable life and career. I want to start with your youth. You grew up in Detroit during the height of the Motown years. And I understand that as a kid, you actually would see stars like David Ruffin and Smokey Robinson just driving around town. They were all around town. You know, Detroit was uh, the uh, home of Motown. And uh, when we were kids, you know, I grew up in a, a rough area. And when we were kids, we would sit on the porch and see them drive by in their big cars, Fleetwoods and, uh, and Buicks. But we all grew up thinking, wow, we want to we wanna be like that because we would hear the music and then see these people around town. It was great. I understand you grew up in a church that was fairly political and that you actually met Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King Jr. Wow, you have been doing your research. Yes. Yeah, I, I grew up in a church that was called Plymouth Congregational Church. Uh, it was, um, it, they later changed the name to Plymouth United Church of Christ. And it was, um, the minister was Reverend Nicholas Hood. He also had a council seat in the Detroit City Council. So he was very political and, and, and he also went to uh, Yale. He went to Yale Divinity School. So he was re really uh, one of the beginners in of uh, the civil rights movement, but he was more behind the scene. So yeah, when I was young, I saw Martin Luther King. He came to our church and as well as Jackie Robinson. And that was a thrill for me. I just noticed how big Jackie Robinson looked to me. I was just a kid. You come from a highly accomplished family. Your father went to Morehouse. Your mom went to Spelman. You went to Michigan State and got a theater degree. Your sister got a PhD in music. What I want to know is, how did your parents react when you told them you wanted a career in show business? They didn't know much about show business. Everybody in Detroit uh, worked, the work that they did centered around the factory. My parents were kind of, um, they came from the South and in the South, people were going to the North for a better job opportunity. And, um, and even though my parents went to college there, they decided to move to Detroit. Back then there was white flight. So they bought their house from white people. And soon the neighborhood became black because once one black moved in, all the whites, took off and moved to the suburbs. That was just the way it was back then. And, um, and so my sister and I were born there and we, we, we grew up. The, the, the neighborhood, I have to say, became rough. And I had to fight every day and it was a really tough experience. But when I went home, I got two different attitudes. My parents were educated and were always trying to tell my sister and I to reach for the stars, reach for the best. And uh, they started us off in both in music, uh, but my sister went all the way and she continued to play piano and sing. And uh, she ended up conducting the Detroit Symphony for a little while and also the Chicago Symphony. So she's the real star of the family. You've done pretty well yourself, Ernest. Yeah, I did no no chop liver. My parents were eventually, I was sort of a black sheep, but they instilled, um, they gave me a good background. And the thing is, they instilled something in me to uh, drive me by day, as my father would say, and burn me at night. And uh, I never forgot that. He got that from, that was a saying from um, the, the head of Morehouse. And uh, he always told me about that. And he would give me all these little anecdotes to continue in life. And I just did. And uh, I never wanted to let him down. Even though we disagreed in, in, as I got bigger, 
But I got out of the house immediately and I always had him in the back of my mind. He drove me to do what I ended up doing. I just wanted to kind of prove myself to my father and especially my mother. My mother was my biggest fan. She just, she promoted me back home. Like she should have been my publicist. She was that, she was just always there for me. I loved her, but my father drove me. And so this is what, this was the result. Well, another expression that your father used that I really love is a ship can't sink unless the water gets inside it. Was he talking about self-esteem? Yes, he was. That's amazing. You have done your research. I admire you. That is incredible. But yes, he uh, he used to tell me, uh, don't let what people say about you um, detour you or stop you from doing anything great. Because of water, if the water doesn't get inside of a ship, it can't sink. And I took that to heart as well, you know, because as you move up the ladder, especially when you become ambitious and start to do uh, greater things and you're reaching for greater things, you find a lot of opposition. People want to stop you from doing something because one, maybe they feel bad themselves that they're not uh, reaching their goals. And they and and it's the crabs in the basket syndrome, and then other ones are up there and want to hold you back. Nobody is really your friend, and in many instances, and they can talk about you to try to discourage you. But don't take it to heart. Believe what you believe, and that's all that counts. It's between you and God. Ernest, I don't think a lot of people know that your career in Hollywood started when Francis Ford Coppola brought you to L.A. to do a screen test for a. Apocalypse Now. I think it was Lawrence Fishburne who got the role, but you've never looked back. Yes, you're right about that. Uh, I met uh, Francis Ford Coppola in New York. In New York, uh, I had done a couple of films, like my first film was Three Days of the Condor, and that was the first speaking role that I ever had in the film. And as a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I was a starving actor out there, and uh, I had a couple of tokens. I was staying with a friend in Brooklyn Heights, and I took the token to 42nd Street because I saw an audition where they said they were going to pay $125 a day to uh, be in a film. At that time, $125 was like a million dollars to me. I got there. And the guy says, you are perfect. Oh, I love it. I love you. Yes, yes, yes. And he had me and he says, $125 a day. Yes, we'll pay you that. This is a good film, good film, a good porno film. Porno. Yeah. I said, wow. Um, will they, will many people be watching it? Oh, nobody will see it. I said, I'm not sure. I said, so what kind of, um, what will I have to do? He said, well, there's soft porn where you don't have to have any sex. And I say, I, I assume that the hard porn is, I have to have sex on, on screen. And he said, yeah, but you know, nobody's gonna watch it. And I said, mm, no, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think I'd rather do that, not on film, okay? And so he says, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm gonna let you go. And then, uh, thank you so much. And I was starving. This is how God works. Just the next week, I was hustling because I would get up four o'clock every morning and get this trade paper called backstage and try to get it before I could get to an audition before other people did. And I went to that day hustling, looking for my, uh, looking for some kind of audition. I was looking for an agency and I walked into the wrong office. What they saw was a guy, what I saw was a guy standing there filming these two people. And I said, I'm so sorry. I, I walked into the wrong office. Um, I was looking for an agency. No, he said, come here, come here, come here. I came over. Next thing you know, he said, read this. And so he put me on film. And he said, you are perfect. I said, okay, what is this? <laughs> he says, it's a movie called Three Days of the Condor. But are you union? I say, uh, and I used to hear that if you tell them that you're union and you're not, 
they'll blackball you forever. You know, they really scared you. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and they said, that's all right. Go to the set. Because I guess he was casting the smaller role. And he said, go to the set. If they kick you off, nothing I can do about that. So I went to the set the next day. They had all these people on a bus. And the next thing you know, they told us to, they were calling all these people and then they called me by myself. I said, oh gosh, they discovered me. And the next thing you know, they said, I thought he was gonna say, stay out and stay out. But they took me instead to where all the action was. And I saw all these people rolled off. I had this big fro. People didn't know who I was. I got there, Sidney Pollack says, Hi, I'm Sidney Pollack, and this is Robert Refford. You two have scenes together. To make a long story short, we filmed for about a week. I was making $350 a day, and that was my first speaking role in a film. So in other words, to tell the young actor, stick by your guns because, you know, God has his hand on you. You stay true to what you want to do. Robert Refford. And I became good, well, you know, pretty tight. We were friends. He was really a good guy. I saw him again later in my career. When I, after I did a movie called White Man Can't Jump, I, I was one of the stars of that one with Woody Harrelson. And Woody calls me and says, Ernest, come on over, your boy's here. Because he was doing a, um, a movie called Indecent Proposal. He was starring opposite Robert Redford. And he says, we're downtown shooting. Come on, he knows you, he remembers you. I said, okay, I came down there. And, and oh man, we had so much fun. Uh, they were filming, but I was just hanging out on the set. And Robert Redford, he surprised me, <laughs> one, because when I first saw him, I knew he was about, oops, I thought he was about six feet tall. And then when I saw him again, he was about five, eight. And I was like, what happened, <laughs> you know? So he must have had lips. I was surprised, but he was so cool. And Ernest Harden Jr., Ernest Harden Jr., what's up? You know, and uh, he was great. So I had, I had that was a, that movie gave me a lot. The Three Days of Condor gave me a lot more than money. It gave me a nice relationship with uh, uh, some good people. Oh, absolutely. One of the things that impresses me about you as a young actor in Los Angeles you connected with the Inner City Cultural Center, which was the country's first minority-owned and operated performing arts school. And you got some fantastic opportunities there, didn't you? Yes, I did. Uh, we were, we did a play, I did a couple of plays there. One with um, uh, Glenn Turman, who directed this particular piece. Uh, it was called Jesse in the Game about the Jesse Owens story. And it did so well over there at the Inner City Cultural Center. That was so much, it was such a wealth of black talent there. That was an outlet for blacks because we, obviously we didn't get the work like our uh, white counterparts. It was really, it's always been a tough, it was a tough business for everybody to be telling the truth. But we had a, um, we had a we had a, sort of a double whammy on us, and that was a great outlet to um, to allow young black talent and older black talent to work. And uh, we did some good things there. I, I enjoyed it. Well, okay, Ernest. I know you've been asked about this a million times, but no interview with you would be complete without a few questions about your role in the smash hit TV show, The Jeffersons. From 1977 to 1979, you played Marcus Henderson, a delinquent teenager who worked for George Jefferson. That's really the first role that made you a household name, isn't it? It is. But actually, I started in 76 as another character. 1976, it was a character called Jason King. And uh, only did one show. But the, the network liked me so much. They called me before the show even came out and said, we want to offer you a series. I was uh, pretty nervous about it, but I went and I remember sitting in the producer's office, Don Nichols, I was looking at the script. And as I thumbed through the script, I didn't see Jason's name in the script at all. And I said, oh, wow, I guess they're starting me off small. No problem. You know, I'm on the show, at least that. 
And so Don says, how do you like the script? And I said, oh, it's great, it's great. I mean, what am I gonna tell him? Well, he said, yeah, Marcus, you should like this role. And, and that's what happened. They had changed my name to Marcus Henderson. I looked at it and Marcus was on every page. I was like, wow, okay, now <laughs> this is a real test. And he says, yeah, Marcus, so, you know, do your thing and uh, we're, we're rooting for you. Well, needless to say, uh, the show turned out really, really good, really cool. I didn't go to sleep that week. I studied so hard to really try to make it the best it could be. And it turned out great. The fan reaction was so great because they were in the uh, audience uh, watching while I was filming. And the, the girls and everybody just seemed to really uh, like me and they said, and they said the producer told them to say, write some more for that kid right now. And they had to leave and go write. So that was a good experience. I did it. It was fun. It was a great cast. And uh, I would still be doing it if they were around. It was a, it was a fun time. What was uh, Sherman Helmsley like? Was he really as carefree as he appeared to be on the screen? He was carefree, but he was very private. And he was very, he was quiet. Um, around um, people. He didn't like crowds at all. He would wait, they would have fans waiting for all of us after we finished each show in our dressing rooms. And you walk out and a lot of times you'd sign autographs for the fans, or whatever, but he didn't like that. He would wait till everybody left. He just, he was shy. It's amazing. But amongst two or three of his good friends, he would be himself and he would, he was hilarious. And so, but he was shy around, around crowds. That was amazing. What about Isabel Sanford? She had such incredible warmth. What was she like to work with? Very talented actress. She was just, I learned so much from, from both of them. And uh, she, she was the one that was getting Emmys uh, because she was, she was just real. When I first started the show, she, she knew that I had a lot. Like I said, I was on every page. But she invited me to her house one weekend, and we worked on the script together. She was just that giving as an actress, and uh, I appreciated her. Now we're talking the late 70s. The Jeffersons was a landmark show because finally a Black family was being portrayed as wealthy and successful. Right. Did you understand at the time that you were actually part of a groundbreaking step forward in the way that people of color were being portrayed on TV? I, I did to a point, yes. And uh, I, I, but I had no idea that it was going to be part of the fabric of America, which it became. And I am so blessed to have been a part of that show. In 1980, you got the role of a lifetime. You co-starred with the legendary Betty Davis in White Mama, which is an incredibly powerful made-for-TV movie that was way ahead of its time. How did you get the role? There was something that I did on the, um, on, uh, for the Hollywood Museum. They asked me to uh, write something. And so I want to, I want to read it if it's okay because it's, uh, it's accurate, it's very accurate. So, just meeting the legendary Betty Davis to an actor was a blessing, let alone being asked to work with her on film. This is how it happened. My best friend, fellow actor, Dorian Harewood, who is now the voice of NBC, first set up the meeting with me and Miss Davis. Miss Davis worked with him in a play and wanted him to play the lead role in the movie for CBS. The producers in the network thought that he looked too old for the part at the time. They wanted someone who looked more like a young teenager. So he recommended me, we were best friends. Even though I had graduated from Michigan State University a couple of years before, I guess I still had a young look. At the time, I was on a very popular hit television show, The Jeffersons, as Marcus Henderson, produced by Norman Lear. The meeting with Miss Betty Davis 
was set up at her home in West Hollywood in an apartment building called the Colonial House. When I got there, I was trying my best to keep a cool front, but all the while, my insides were screaming, this can't be happening. The first thing that happened, I noticed, were all the little silver cigarette holders around the apartment with the letters BD inscribed on them. She smoked a lot of cigarettes, yet she lived a long life. That's how tough she was. We talked about the script, my Detroit background, and about the business in general. She made the interview very easy and relaxed. It turned out to be a wonderful conversation, and I felt like we had really hit it off. She then said, I really like you, Ernest. You should get, who should you get to direct us? I said to myself, us? Oh, oh yes, us, of course us. Uh, you pick them, Betty. <laughs> you see, I had gotten relaxed thinking that we were on the first name basis then. She was so down to earth, she later picked up her longtime friend and another Hollywood legend, Mr. Jackie Cooper, to direct the picture. When the meeting was all over, I can remember thinking how good God is and how miracles do happen. I floated out that apartment. The movie was entitled for much of the shoot, but eventually was called White Mama, written by Robert C.S. Downs and a wonderful cast, including Broadway star Virginia Capers and Oscar winner Eileen Hacker. I have so many wonderful stories while making that film that I could share, but we'd be here all night. So here's just a few. On the set is where I first met Miss Catherine Cermak. She was Miss Betty Davis's assistant. Her beauty distracted me for a moment and Miss Davis picked up on that right away saying, ah, stay focused, young man. <laughs> but actually I was focused. I tried to soak up everything I could like a sponge. It was amazing to see her preparation up close and how she went about creating her character, even down to figuring out what role, wardrobe she was going to wear, wear for each scene in the movie. I did all I could as a young actor to keep learning and to keep up, learning as much as I could, as fast as I could. I had to learn three scripts before we even started working on the actual shooting script. I wanted to be line ready, no matter what the script was that we ended up using. She knew playing my mother that we had to really become close to make our roles as mother and son believable. And that we did. We became very close, talked all the time, even on the phone before and after shooting. We, she wrote me letters and sent me holiday cards and stayed in contact with me until she died. She could also be tough. She would watch the dailies and the camera operators would sit there biting their nails because if they had filmed her not to her liking, they were gone. <laughs> One day I saw her, the producers and the director who were all in disagreement about something go into a room and later come out with some of them having tears in their eyes. I don't know what happened in there, but right afterwards she walked out last, came up to me and said, that's over. Now let's get to work. She could be tough. Yet on the other hand, she was so giving as an actor. In her contract, she had a clause where she couldn't work. They couldn't work her, but so many hours, and like me, where I could be worked until I dropped. So I was just doing a big scene that I had a lot of dialogue where I was the only one mostly on camera. I was reading it with the script girl as she was just saying the lines with no feeling. Ms. Davis was walking by where we were shooting and leaving the set to go home because her day was done. She saw what was happening and said, oh no, pull off her coat and did the scene with me. She didn't have to do that. She wasn't even on camera, but she knew her doing it with me was going to bring out my best performance. She was always about the work first. A very giving actor. Her actor friends like Rodney McDowell and Robert Wagner would come to the set to see her 
for lunch and at times would allow me to hang and listen to the amazing stories that they shared about old Hollywood. She talked about how she used to call Ronald Reagan Little Ronnie <laughs> and how she felt that Errol Flynn was a terrible actor. She told me how she used to arrange for her black friends to sit in the balcony of the theater when she performed because they weren't allowed in at all. It was fascinating to hear those inside stories about old Hollywood. Yet it was such a contrast being around such Hollywood royalty while working downtown LA around such extreme poverty, poverty in the middle of the homeless community there. Both were a real education, but seeing how the homeless lived down there every day was heartbreaking for me to see. I remember one evening, Ms. Davis said to me that we were all riding home from a day's work on the set. And Ernest, do you want to hear this? She said, Jackie Cooper and her, they were reading fan mail on the way home. She said, I ask you first because I want you to know that these letters are bad and are hate mail. I said, sure, why not? I'm from the streets of Detroit. I felt like I had seen and heard pretty much everything. So when Jackie Cooper started reading them out loud, to be honest, I was shocked, amazed, and a little hurt to know that there were still people out there with such hate and could write such hateful mail, especially to a legend like Betty Davis. One said, I used to be your biggest fan, but I never watched another, I'll never watch another one of your movies again, Miss Davis, now that I hear that you are doing a movie with a, the N word. Oh. Me being naive at the time, thought the majority of that kind of racism had been over when Martin Luther King died in 1968. Here this was, 1979. I felt so stupid. But unfortunately, even today's racism is alive and well. Anyway, we took all that in stride and did our best, and the movie was later nominated for an Emmy. White Mama wasn't the original title of the book, but she insisted on being, that being the title of the movie, which I believe she saw. She wanted to make sure that she defied all those racist people and let them know without a doubt that she was starring in a movie opposite a black man. In fact, I'm the only black person to ever star opposite her in a film. And I know that film helped pave the way for many others like it afterward. She said that she loved my work. We talked about doing three more films together. And I'm quite sure if, if she had stayed healthy and lived long enough, we would have. That's who Betty Davis really was. She had a wonderful heart. She was my leading lady, an honor that I will probably take with me to my grave. She was a great woman, ahead of her time in so many ways. One of our finest talents ever, and a great friend. She loved all people, I know this for a fact. Betty, you always be missed by me and millions of your loving fans around the world. I truly love you with all my heart. You will always be my white mama, Ernest Harden Jr. So that's what I read. Yeah, so that capsulates it all. Oh, this is wow. what she gave me. I don't know if you can see that. This oh, is, uh, wow. yeah, yes, yes, yes. she signed it and this is, just to show you that I love working with you, Betty D, to Ernest. And this is a book that she gave me. It's called The Lonely Life. Um, and she signed it. Ernest, may we work together again someday. Love, Betty D. So we, we talked a lot, and we did talk about doing other films together. And, uh, but, uh, that never happened, I guess, because, you know, she, she didn't live much longer after that. Not only am I the only black to star opposite her, but right now, I'm, I think I'm the only living person to ever star opposite. To not ever, but to have starred 
opposite her. Most of them are gone. We recently had Catherine Cermak on the show. She was Miss Davis's personal assistant for the last decade of her life. She told me that Betty Davis really loved you and cherished her friendship with you right up until the day she died. Oh, well, that's great to hear. I, because um, there's one thing I think she respected was a hard worker. And um, I am a hard worker when it comes to uh, my business. I have fun and, and do my thing, but every time I get a role, I, I put my all into it. And I think she saw that and respected it. After White Mama, you were really red hot as an actor. I always thought that you would have been the perfect choice to portray Martin Luther King in a movie. I just wish that would have happened. Yeah, I do too. I, you know, uh, it is so amazing because I learned one of his speeches. You know, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of his creed. I've done that speech in front of maybe 4,000 people. Um, so I can imagine how he felt being in front of 20,000. It's amazing. And uh, every bit of that speech still applies today. It's been a long fight. Uh, it's a fight that started even before I was born on my parents, as fact, because back before, uh, in their day, people were getting hung, Blacks were getting hung just to read. They had separate war departments and, and bathrooms. Couldn't use public, the same water fountain or bathroom. I remember as a young, young guy, we would always go back to the South because my uh, parents' family still lived back there in Atlanta. And on the way to Atlanta, we'd drive through places like Kentucky and all of that. And I remember one time we were, were there and I was hungry and I saw this restaurant open and this big fat guy was eating this big hamburger. I said, well, what about right there? That's fine. He said, be quiet, son. Let me ask the, the uh, policeman. And he went up and the policeman said, oh yeah, go on down there, boy, around the corner, down there through, you know, and you'll find a restaurant. So I was still young. I didn't understand this because Detroit, where I lived was basically in the area was all black. So we weren't racist against each other. I just, and you see whites on television or whatever, but you know, you didn't interact with them too much. You just didn't think about it. And we drive to this, we drove this little place about as big as, I don't know, a room. And, um, and, and it was dingy looking and it was, I just told my father, he said, come on, let's get some horse meat. He was making a joke. And I said, I don't want any horse meat. I just don't want anything. I wasn't even hungry. Oh, and that was, that's the kind of thing. Or my mother, I remember we were in Detroit. We were sitting at a, a, a restaurant called Kresge's. And I don't know if they even have those anymore. But we sat there at the counter for, you know, an hour at least. And people were getting served all around us. Oh, and wow. we're just talking. And my mother just insisted on going. And and so we sat there. And then finally the lady came up and said, you know, we don't serve Negroes here. But uh, that's the kind of thing that you grow up with. And you realize that that fight was was a, a continuum. And it was a work in progress. And it continues even today with the... the um, the trial that you're seeing on TV and the George Floyd um, uh, murder. And I call it a murder because I believe it is. And I just say that we, we still have a long way to go, but I think what happened with the George Floyd incident and everything, that that pulled the sheet off of America. It made, because we never saw America and other places look at themselves quite like they do now and look in the mirror and say, wow, we were really doing black and brown people pretty bad. And we, and you know, normally they could go in their communities and forget all about it, but this pulled the sheet and it's in the forefront of the television every day. And even though it's a hard pill to swallow, to understand all the systemic, the systemic racism and everything, 
it's something that has to happen. And I think we will all come out better for it. It's a continuum. It's a fight. I'm, I'm hopeful. And I just believe that it's going to be a better day. I think it's already started. And I just think a lot of positive stuff is starting to happen. It's got to change. We're looking at ourselves as America. And I just think um, I'm hopeful. I'm really, I'm excited. And uh, yes, hard times, but necessary times. And, uh, and it's going to be beautiful to, to lead to beautiful times for all of us. I sure hope so. I really do. Now, getting back to your career, in 1992, you played George in White Men Can't Jump with Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson, and the movie was a huge success, and you became even more of a household name. Is that one of your favorite movies, Ernest? It really was, because I grew up playing basketball. I was there playing freshman basketball at Michigan State, but I played, continued to play. That's how I ended up getting in White Man Can't Jump, because... I was still good at that game. And uh, and what happened was when they were auditioning for it, I was on tour with a play. And I was working out with a guy who was semi-pro and I was making money. So I paid him to work out with me and he followed me around the different cities. Flew me in. I flew in on a dark day of the theater and went and uh, the next thing you know, we're playing, and I'm seeing Woody Harrelson, all those guys playing. And so they would set up, they had this uh, this uh, warehouse where they set up this basket. And they called me, they said, you ready? Yes. But I, I saw those, those basketball games, I felt like I was a man among boys here. And, uh, and so I, I they, they threw the first ball, and they were jumping up, trying to make the basket. Then the ball bounced over to me, bam, I made it. They said, oh. And so then they tried it again the next play, and then ball, they were fighting for the ball. And Banks bounced over to me, wham, I made it again. Then they started throwing it to me, wham, I made it again. I shot the next five. Everybody said, whoa, who is this guy? And after that, I would shoot them all day. Finally, uh, Ron Sheldon, who directed that movie, was up. In, at some high place looking over the court. He was hiding. He came down from there. They let everybody go home. They said, except you, Ernest. He said, I'm going to give you a script and uh, and we'll let you read. They, you, they had to see your basketball game first before. And then some of the actors, which they're jealous. Why does Ernest stay? Why does he have to stay? Uh, I'm good, maybe. <laughs> and so I think that, that was yeah. how I got into White Man Jump. I mean, I, I read, and uh, after that, it was just a done deal. And, and in fact, he cast so many actual pro basketball players for that movie. The only non-pros were myself, Wesley, Woody, and uh, Kadeem Hardison. The rest of them had, had pro experience. So that was my White Man Can't Jump experience. And I didn't think much... I didn't know if that movie was going to do much. I was hoping that it would. And it came a classic. Everybody started. That movie, they, it's still, I look at my residual checks, it still pays me better than anything else. <laughs> yeah, it's just running. And it's, it's all the ball players, pro ball players saw it. And, and everybody it just became a, a cult classic. Now, one of the things that interests me a lot about you is that you are a member of the Actors Studio and you studied under Martin Landau. What was that mm. like? Martin was, he was one of my best friends. He was, he was great. Every week, uh, we would go to something that he called in the Actors Studio, the session. And that's when uh, you would have to sign up you eventually get up and you would have to have work that you worked up you worked on uh, prior to going up and then people sit there and some of these people are oscar winners broadway all kinds of people like al pacino anybody could be in there and they'd sit there and they critique your work it was just all uh, about your work 
and how to improve it. I learned so much from Mark Landau because even in his older, even though he was older, he could break down what you needed to do better than anyone. I, he was, his mind was so amazing at and in depth in what you needed to improve your scene. Well, there was a wonderful short that came out of the actor's studio called Stanford and Son, where you played a 63-year-old rapper. I just loved that movie. You should be so proud of your work in that film. Wow, I'm surprised you saw that. Yeah, it. first of all, it was a short, about mm, 25 minutes long, and it went all over the world. And we got so many, um, we won so many film festivals with that piece. Basically, the theme of that movie is you're never too old. You're never too old to do what you deserve and desire. The age is nothing. And 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 the people related to that because every time we showed that movie, they would stand up and cheer. I think that one of the things that really shows in your actor studio training is that you're equally comfortable on the stage and on the screen. Your stage work in Beethoven's Misfortune Cookies, which was a one-man show, got rave reviews. You got a 10-minute standing ovation everywhere you played. Was that one of your favorite roles? It was, you know, and that, that was, I put my heart and soul into that. The movie was about a music history professor who had a radical teaching style, and he also right. had mental health issues. Right. He had a radical teaching style. And the uh, university felt that uh, that style wasn't good for them, but the students loved it. That play I loved because it was eye-opening, it was awakening, awakening, uh, thought-provoking, and also uh, it just showed black a black man as an intelligent professor. We did this play for a year or so. I wanted to try to take it to Broadway, <sighs> but that's how it is. The reason I mentioned the actor's studio in the context of Beethoven's Misfortune Cookies is because your focus as an actor is very intense. You disappear into the role, and I was wondering if that is a hallmark of being a method actor. It is. Um, you, you do become the role, and... Uh, and the more um, meticulous you can get with thinking about every aspect of that character, the better it is. The more, and the more you believe it, the the more the audience will believe it. Just want to to always want to know that if someone sees my name on a project, that it's um, they say that's quality. We want we we want to see that because. No matter what it is, it's it's quality. So I'm really I, that that's what I'm striving for. Finding work as an actor has always been hard, as you mentioned, and it's even harder for people of color. You've been working as an actor in Hollywood since 1975. Have you seen any significant improvement in the opportunities and the diversity in Hollywood casting? I have some. I'm op always optimistic because it's been a long journey for me. But with all these new outlets, cable, uh, HBO, Showtime, all these new outlets, there are more opportunities. But it's still a tough business. It's always going to be that way for all of us. Uh, but I do. And I also say this, <clears throat> and I don't mean to be uh, negative, but we as, as as blacks have always had to compete against other groups. One back in the day was athletes. Then in my my age range, it became the rappers, the comedians, the rappers especially. They were like saying, Well, they already have a following. That was their excuse. Instead of like, well, why don't you just make us the stars? No, but they already have a following. So we want that following to be transferred into film. And then, then all of a sudden, the influx of of uh, 
people coming across the pond and doing American movies. That's a, you know, they've been doing that ever since Sidney Poitier and um, Harry Belafonte. That's okay. But the influx is, is what, is, if it wasn't hard enough for us to get roles already, they say, well, you know, you're, you're like a garden variety Negro. We see you all the time. We want some exotic ones that come across the pond. And and we and they be they do movies like Detroit, which they don't even know where Detroit is on the map. Uh, they do uh, Harriet Tubman. I, wonderful actors. Don't get me wrong. Great talent. Harriet Tubman. That's one of our icons. I just saw the other day doing the Aretha Franklin from you know from England. I'd say fantastic, but. Can we do that? Can we go over there and do that? No, the unions stop that. Uh, even going to Canada where you are, they they only allow two, that's it, you know. But we just allow them to come in and do. And I'm not against the actor or the actress, anybody who says, uh, hey, we want you to play Aretha Franklin. Uh, yeah, okay. You know, you're an actor, you want to work. It's the people who hire that I feel. You mean you can't, if you, you're you saying that's so insulting, we got people to come from Juilliard, wherever, you know, you mean to tell me there's nobody that could do that and that's American. So I see that the way it's happening. And as a matter of fact, when I look at the Oscars, nobody has an American accent who's receiving Oscars, not just black, white, everybody. So. It's just, I just, that's what I'm noticing. And I don't know if that's making it harder or what, it's just what it is. You're a, a highly respected actor and also a role model. And that just comes with the territory when you're a member of a minority. I certainly feel that responsibility as a gay man. Does that sense of being a role model and knowing that people respect you, does it affect your choice of roles that you will agree to play? Yeah. It does. Um, some of them, I mean, it's not every, I have every role that I've gotten, a couple of them I regret doing. <laughs> I was like, why did I do that? You know, I needed money. But <clears throat> most of the time I'm, I'm trying to be conscious of what I'm doing. And uh, because I know in the long run, it'd be better for me um, when people look back at my career. I did a play actually called Velvet Jesus. And uh, we're actually gonna shoot a movie and it's about uh, a young guy who felt that he was abused and raped by his stepfather. This is something that they don't talk about in the black community much. Uh, they try to, oh, keep that stuff, keep that stuff out of the limelight, but it happened. And obviously the guy who wrote this is a gay man and he's writing about his life. Those are real stories. Those are stories that I believe should be told. I'm glad that we're shooting a movie about it. The experience of trying to understand the mental trauma that, <clears throat> that black gays I, you know, go through and <clears throat> Is, is just something that people don't think about. And I'm like, so I'm sensitive to all that. And I just always want to portray something that's real and something that will better the lives of anybody who watches it. I think that's amazing. And I hope that, uh, that everybody uh, goes uh, to see that movie. It's called Velvet Jesus. I right. wanna ask you, Ernest, despite your great success, have you had hard times and struggles in Hollywood over the years? Yes, a lot. Really? I, even from the beginning, you know, because again, the time that I stepped out, there were not, not a lot of role models. I love James Earl Jones. Uh, that's who I look up to. Um, and that's why, like I have, my name is Ernest Hardin Jr., just to have, three names, you know, 
Okay. Yeah, I just really admired him. I like Richard Roundtree, who turned out to be a fine actor. If you if you know who he was, he was the star of this movie called Share. Well, he was dark complected like me. And we got to be real good friends later on. He called me his little brother, and we used to hang out. And people were like, a lot of times thought we were in the same family. So I just really, those are the people I looked up to. And I remember just at the beginning, having nowhere to live, staying on a park bench for a while. And I remember thinking there one time that I said, gosh, this is, I feel so lonely being here on this park bench. What could be worse? I see lovers walking away hand in hand. What could, this is just, this is, this is rough. And I said, what could be worse than this? And then it started raining on me. And I said, okay, Lord, I see. <laughs> this could be worse. But, and then what people don't realize was after I got success and things started happening and, you know, I got a lot of success, especially when I was younger, you know, I, a drought again, a drought. I wasn't working, and I ended up driving limos and driving a cab, you know. I did that for a while, and not long, about a year and a half. I did it about a year and a half. And then all of a sudden, I would get some big part, and then I'm back into it. So it's just, it let people know that careers do this. They are not always a sin, especially Black people. They're just, you know. Uh, after the white mama, I was hot as I don't know what. But then after a while, uh, they're looking at somebody else who's cheaper and uh, is hotter. You know what I mean? And they try to put you to pasture, so you always have to be resourceful. It's a and you're right. I'm right now everywhere I go. I'm on the set. They say, "Ah, oh, you're a legend." Well, I think, you know, I thank God that maybe longevity, there's something to be said for longevity. Yeah. You're well known in the business to be very grounded and centered. You're very down to earth. Ernest, you have no ego. There's never been any scandals surrounding you. You've handled success in a very balanced way. What prepared you to manage fame so intelligently and so maturely? You know, that's a that's a good one because I see how it has taken some of my counterparts out, maybe through drugs and uh, or doing stuff, crazy stuff like shoplifting or whatever, you know. And uh, it's like I say, I was just, I was, I was just grounded. I had to go back to my 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 parents. I never wanted to embarrass them. I remember one girl, Lori Carlos. She said to me one time. Said, I'm gonna tell you something, Ernest. I always remember this. If you don't want people to know something, don't do it. <laughs> and I kept that in mind because they will find out. You know, some people come here with a preconceived notion of how I have to be a Hollywood star and I have to treat people bad and look down on people, and for them to feel that maybe uh, the people won't do that to them. So they have to feel like they're putting someone down or something. But I never felt that. I felt my work uh, spoke for itself. We're on stage. I can go toe to toe with anybody. That's how I felt. And so after that, I'm me being silly and doing whatever I want to do, playing basketball, doing whatever I felt like doing. I'm going to be me. When I get on stage, I nobody can outwork me, you know, I felt that. And I just, I did my work. I worked with Betty Davis. I worked with the best. So I was confident in that. And I didn't have to front when I, when I left the stage. And I think that kept me grounded. And I'm spiritual. I'm very spiritual. Came from church. I'm very spiritual. I love the Lord. And I believe he had his hand on me all this time. I really believe that too. Uh, I just wanted to mention one film. It's another short our bus stop that we just finished and uh, um, directed by a woman named Peach Andra Du Bois. 
a young sister who I believe is coming up and is going to be probably the next du uh, Ava DuVernay. Well, Ernest, it's been an absolute joy to spend this time with you. There's so much to admire and respect about your talent and your career choices and your personal integrity. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Hey, listen, thank you. Um, and so amazing that you even got down to the things that my father even told me about, you know, would teach me and all of that. I said, I, that's incredible. You're incredible. Thank you so much for inviting me. I, uh, I appreciate you so much. I hope every time you have a, a new and exciting project you want to share with us, you're always welcome. Please come back, Ernest. I, I will. I'll see you soon. We know each other now, and this is beautiful. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I want to thank Ernest Hardin Jr. so much for being on our show. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.